Hello, my name is Renee Skaggs from the Pierce Conservation District, and we are here today on Pete Allison's farm, uh, Old Hayfield, and we have worked with WSU Extension from both Puyallup and the San Juans to seed in various types of clovers. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Doug Collins and I'm with WSU at the Puyallup Research and Extension Center. And I helped out here to sort of design and plant this experiment, um, working with Brooke, who we're very happy to have uh, today from San Juan. So I think he's more of the pasture expert. I work on uh, soils and I do a lot with reduced tillage um, with vegetable production. So this was kind of fun here to look at reduced tillage with uh, pasture renovation. Um, so I will, um, I just planted it using the Pierce Conservation District no-till drill, which is a fabulous tool and we're all very lucky to have in this county. So I've used it quite a bit um, for this project and also for planting cover crops. Um, and we're experimenting more and more with uh, planting cover crops, like fall cover crops now, without tillage. So something we can do with that tool that um, would not be possible otherwise. And so I will pass it off to Brooke to tell a little bit more about the intricacies of this experiment and what we're looking for and what he's found. You have your own mic, right? Yep. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Take it away, Brooke. Um, yeah, I'm Brooke Brower. So I'm down from San Juan County where I'm based. I'm a county extension director and regional agricultural specialist. Um, I do work with diversified farms, small scale, livestock, mixed vegetable production, um, kind of work yeah, across a range of crops and animal types. Um, in the county where I'm based is pasture and hay fields is kind of the largest agricultural land use. So really interested in ways to improve the productivity and the quality of those fields. Um, interested in ways that we can do that with reduced tillage, reduced cost potentially. Um, and then also, yeah, just how can we um, bring some of those hay fields back to back to life, um, particularly where I am at in the islands. A lot of our fields are in really rough shape. They've been hayed continuously for a long, long time. So really low forage quality, low productivity, um, low species diversity, um, oftentimes very little in the way of a legume component. Um, a lot of um, tall fescue dominated pastures and hay fields, which is mostly what we're seeing here. Um, so that's just a little bit of context in terms of kind of why I'm interested in this work. Um, what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about a couple of different experiments we've been doing with both um, fertilizer amendments um, and then talk a little bit about the no-till seeding uh, work that we've, we've done up there as, as well as the trial here. So I'm going to start out with a little bit of a kind of an arm wavy component and then we're going to have some time to um, take a look at these plots. Um, but I think it would be helpful for probably for you to kind of understand what I'm talking about. If you want to, if you haven't already, there's three handouts, um, kind of this no-till amendment and then an organic fertilizer and then this Puyallup no-till legume trial handout. Um, and these are kind of early preliminary findings from several different studies that kind of pulled together to talk a little bit about uh, some of this different work that we've been doing. Uh, before I dive into it, just kind of get a context of where people are coming from. I'm curious, maybe show of hands or something, who's here with a livestock component in their operation? Okay, and then vegetable or, yeah. And then kind of hay, forage. Cool. So, great. <laughs> We're gonna talk pretty much entirely about kind of hay, forage, field production stuff. Um, I will just say too, if you have questions or also if you have personal experience that you wanna share, feel free to kind of wave your arm around or, or interrupt. Um, I don't want to monologue for too long here, but what I'm going to start with is um, let's go ahead and start with just this organic fertilizer hay trial handout. Um, and that's, I wanted to start with that because that was where I started out with in terms of doing some of this pasture research is 
just a really basic question is what kind of benefit do we see from bringing in some amendment to an older hay field that's been neglected and um, hasn't been hasn't been amended in a while um, so on that first kind of just trial methods there you can see the organic fertilizer rates and amounts that we put on so we started this um, in spring of 2018 and we put on about 117 pounds of N 130 pounds of phosphorus and 330 pounds of, of potassium uh, honestly that was a mistake um, I made a miscalculation so it's more more potassium than we we really needed to apply based on soil test so the other rates were based on a soil test and a recommended rate and then we kind of increased the nitrogen a little bit and accidentally increased the um, potassium and then we've been tracking it for multiple years and so the basic question we're interested in is what's the impact of that on forage quality and um, biomass and so in this in this particular system it's that field is cut once a year um, typically in in late June um, from a quality perspective that's not necessarily the best time um, but that's oftentimes just kind of with the hay operator that we were working with that's the way it works with their equipment and their setup is they were needed to cut when it was going to be dry and um, they weren't necessarily so focused on the quality so getting a little bit more volume and lower quality was was fine for their situation um, so we sampled basically right around the time that it was cut for hay so that was either beginning of july or, or late june and we've sampled that every year since um, and so this this graph here you can kind of see there's uh, on the x-axis there that's the total dry weight so that's we take a sample of a specific area we dry that down um, so it's even drier than hay would be um, and then measure that kind of as an estimate of, of biomass per area and the blue line is is with the fertilizer and the orange line is without fertilizer um, so you can see that first year there was a little bit of a bump there was an increase but not a real significant increase in, in productivity so that was the same spring that the fertilizer was applied it was also a pretty dry spring so it wasn't necessarily a lot of chance for the plants to take it up um, that second year and this was kind of a surprise to me is that benefit has persisted for multiple years so that second um, third and even the fourth year we've seen a significant increase in that um, just from one single fertilizer application um, in 2018 and 2019 we also saw a significant increase in the protein content or the nitrogen content of that forage um, so that's that was another kind of quality benefit that we got um, it was still relatively low quality forage but um, it was a it was a significant boost in that regard um, you know I think it's a combination of factors so is it low quality because of the species um, it's low protein forage um, and I don't have the numbers in front of me but it's like six or seven percent protein so I don't know if any of you kind of focus in on on protein for feeding livestock but that's pretty darn low for feeding livestock does anybody know a actual number you should for dry like hay what was that yeah I don't remember so that's what I was asking but I think it's around yeah 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 so so in that metric it's it's relatively low in protein and that's probably a combination of yeah species composition so very little very few legumes so legumes are a great source of protein um, and then also I think some of it has to do with the hay timing so if you hay late typically the the protein content quality is going to be a bit lower because um, it's kind of gone past its prime and then also um, soil nutrition so and that's kind of part of the reason the fertilizer component is what we're seeing a benefit from that particularly nitrogen is is really important for protein content so nitrogen fertilizer can really help boost boost that protein content so 
Does that help answer? Yeah. Um, so over the course of those years, four years, we saw basically five and a half tons more dry matter from that. I'm gonna let you do your own math in terms of your own operation, in terms of whether it's worth it. So one of the, kind of my questions going in and I talk to farmers and they're like, sure, I like fertilizer and sure, I like money. And so does it, does it pay to um, amend? Um, that was one of the things that we started to look at and we were using organic fertilizer here. You could also do it, you know, potentially quite a bit cheaper with a conventional fertilizer. Um, but I was interested is, you know, there hasn't been as much research done with the organic fertilizer, so I wanted to look at that component. Um, well, it varied from year to year, but so the first year is probably about three, three or four thousand pounds in the unfertilized up to five thousand, and the second year is probably about four thousand pounds up to um, 8,000 pounds to over double. So over the course of the cumulative over that, that four year period was a, an increase of, yeah, about 10,000, 11,000 pounds. And that's absolute dry weight. So again, hay actually has a little bit of moisture in it. So a, your hay yield would be a little bit higher than that. Does the weather have an impact on this? I think it does. Yeah. And that's what's, you know, I haven't really looked really hard at the, but just thinking about it. So 2018 was a dry spring and we had a relatively low year. 2019, 20 were pretty good. Um, 2021 was pretty hot and dry. I don't know if anybody <laughs> remembers, but um, so I'm really curious to do this one more year and see, yeah. you know, because it seems like the stressful years that benefit from the fertilizer is less. And that's probably because maybe it's water limited instead of fertilizer limited or some other factor um, in terms of the quality. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, I mean, I think that'd be really interesting. Um, you know, I think, you know, in terms of more and more producers in my area are starting to do pasture and hay field irrigation. I'm not sure about down here. Um, but yeah, looking at some of those interactions would be really interesting, um, to see, you know, what's really limiting. I think anecdotally, the folks that are using irrigation are seeing a big, big benefit and able to get more grazing out of it. Any other questions on that? You mentioned earlier yeah. that uh, late June is the ideal time for the cutting. Why is that? When, when is the ideal? Yeah, and then do you cut late June? <laughs> no, I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> because there's a lot of good reasons yeah. to cut in late June. Do you think yeah. earlier is better or later? Um, from, from a quality perspective, the more kind of vegetate like the grassier it is typically the quality is going to be better gotcha oh so it's regrowing from a shorter yeah right yeah the problem we find is you don't always have weather in late june yeah right you don't get it until the first or second or even third week of july sometimes it happens yeah then it's strong yeah it's terrible in april sometimes in may yeah. Yeah, when I cut hay, I would graze it until about May 15th. We do that too. And then I would let the it fields. grow up. So it was like second cutting by the time my hay guy would come around 4th of July. So it was really, really difficult to get in. It's still in the food stage and have really high protein. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's essentially what we do. So yeah, okay, yeah, yeah you're adding. In Western Washington, that's about the first chance you get. It. Yeah. Late in June, that's yeah. the first chance. Yeah. I mean, yeah. This year, I suppose you could have done it during that hot spell. Yeah. But there was no grass on our fields anyway because we flail mowed them yeah. a month before. Well, we graze and then we will mow it if it's tall for that same reason. Yeah. yeah. It's a, a research farm is going to be quite different, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, well, these the trials here are all on on farm, um, and 
and I, I'm glad you're adding nuance to this because the typical sort of operation where I am at is, yeah, no, no grazing, no mowing, just let it go, and then harvest late June or July. And in that situation, the quality is, is going to suffer. So I think what you're describing makes a lot of sense. So I think there's a lot more to it, obviously, than just the timing. Um, but And a few of the producers I work with are starting to do, they'll do haylage earlier. And so they'll be able to cut and wrap uh, earlier in the spring. They'll maybe do a weather window and do something. And then a few of them are super fast and able to get, you know, small square bales done and just little weather windows earlier and then come back and do second cuttings like you're describing. But we have a lot less rain. We also have less rain, yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm thank, thank you for bringing up those points about the mowing and grazing, and it, yeah, I think that adds a lot yeah, in terms of. Rarely. Yeah. Have weather to put hay up. Yeah. Unless we wait till late June. Yeah. And that's why. How much less we did it. I think we're about 20 inches. Wow. Okay, what so are you? It varies, but yeah, there's a lot of pretty thin, dry okay. soil. What do you? Okay, nice. Yeah. Have you made any distinction between uh, pasture to be paid for, say, like cattle and other livestock and first pasture? Sorry, what was the question again? Have you made, have you like explored any distinctions between, say, pastures for cattle and then, say, pastures or hay for horses? I have not in my work. Yeah, I've made distinctions between pastures for for cattle and pastures for hay or for horses or things like that not specifically so in terms of the work that i've been and the research i've been doing it's you know basically focusing on on what's what's there um in terms of what species are already there and the, and then amending those and then some of this no-till planting that we'll talk about um isn't specifically targeted towards a, a given species but um yeah. Uh, so definitely trying to get a higher protein. Yeah. One of the big challenges we have with horses is we don't really want weight on them. Right. Everybody else yeah. is trying to put weight on their animals. So just disregard everything I say. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's interesting trying to navigate yeah. because two witches in the pasture will actually make them into turtle meals. Right. Um, or obese or metabolic issues. Yeah. So trying to figure out how to work with them. Yeah. It's a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's not necessarily the richness, it's the timing and the grass type. So, yeah, the plants store most of their sugars in the top a couple of inches. So if the horses are allowed to graze too short, they're getting the sugars. But if you rotate very quickly and don't let them stay in the pasture very long, let it eat it down too much, or let them eat it down, then they're not going to get as much sugar. Yeah, and it, along with the sugars, it's also just the pure, the pure weight. Designing pastures to just put less weight on them. Um, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, it's yeah. 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 on the breed too. Yeah. You might only be able to put them out for an hour a day. On yeah, the that's the fields. challenge. Yeah. That's the challenge. And then you got to have somewhere to put them where there is isn't. Yeah. Yeah. We've done a lot of like sort of pasture specific and like horse specific workshops in the past. We've we recorded ones on our website. Great. But we'll also do more. Yeah, so I think in terms of kind of shifting and thinking about the no-till seeding, is is that a way, and sorry if this doesn't necessarily work for horses, but kind of from the, can you improve the quality and, and productivity without 
having to buy a bunch of fertilizer. So could you introduce a legume species that would help increase the protein, maybe help increase the productivity of that stand? Um, so that is that was one of the goals with the um, no-till seeding. What are some of the examples of types of legumes you're talking about? Well, we're going to get there. Yeah, but let's... What's, I'm going to talk one more about one more fertilizer kind of experiment that we did combined with some no-till. Um, and a, yeah, apologies, this again was in um, San Juan County. But so this other no-till plus amendment trial handout talks a little bit about that. Um, we had three different sites there. And what we did in this trial is we did a fall planting in 2019 of a annual Oh, excuse me, yeah, Italian ryegrass and then New Zealand white clover. So used a no-till drill, basically identical to the one here that we'll take a look at. Um, planted those um, late September, early October. Probably too late, um, but that's when we were able to get to it. Um, and then in the spring, we came back and broadcast different rates of fertilizer on top of that seeding and also onto unseeded plots. And again, the basic question is, what can we do to increase the quality and quantity? And then also, do these treatments have any impact on shifting the kind of relative abundance of different species here, either by introducing new ones from planting or by fertilizing, can you sh shift the relative abundance of some of those different species? Um, the table here shows kind of our, um, our fertilizer rates that we applied. So we had a control where we didn't apply any fertilizer and then we did kind of a base and then we increased the amount of nitrogen in those other treatments. I also threw in a, a very, very rough estimate of the cost. Again, this was organic fertilizer. So you can see that got over a thousand dollars per acre. Um, it was very, very rough. It was based on 50 pound bags. You're not getting big totes, but I think it is important to kind of keep that context in mind of like, yeah, you can get a real boost, but you really do have to weigh those, those costs and benefits. And maybe there's other cheaper ways to do it. Um, or maybe you have a neighbor who's got manure or maybe you have manure. Um, that little map down at the bottom just shows an example of that trial layout. So we had um, the faint green strip is where we seeded and then we had different subplots where we had the different fertilizer amendments. Um, and then the second page, just to give you a little context of what those fields look like in, in the spring, uh, the three different trial sites. Uh, Dill Road was a very severely great degraded site. Um, dominant species was daisies um, and dirt and hairy cat's ear and uh, wild carrot and hardly a grass plant to see. Um, the second one, Coffelt Farm, you can see kind of in that photo, there's some like kind of little green blobs. Um, they broadcast a little bit newer on that plot. So you can kind of see that response just from that broadcast uh, compost manure. And then the other side is, is Beaverton, which is a pretty solid fescue dominated um, field. Nope. Um, and that was the other part of this kind of research is what can we get away with, with, you know, basically a really minimal intervention of, we didn't use any herbicide. We didn't do any tillage. All we did pre-plant was mow really close, um, to try and suppress the existing species a little bit. Um, and we can talk more about that, um, in terms of, I think there's other ways that you may get more effective establishment than, than we were able to get in our trials. But, um, well, it was slightly before our trial. It did affect some of the plots. Yep. But, yeah. You can see the little, tried not to sample that little green blob there, but it happens. Um, and then this other page, I just wanted to throw in a couple things. So this was a soil test from one of those sites. 
Um, a couple things I wanted to point out in terms of the soil test is um, the nitrogen, some, of, some soil tests will give you kind of an estimated nitrogen release. Um, and Doug can probably talk more about kind of the pros and cons of, of that. But, um, you know, if you were just to go off this sort of soil test interpretation guide, it says don't add any more nitrogen. Um, what we've, we've found and uh, we'll see on the next page is that adding more nitrogen does really in benefit your, your yield and, and also your quality. And I think some of what's going on is, you know, sometimes that estimated nitrogen release, I believe, is more for a kind of a tillage-based system where you may see more of a response and more release from the organic matter um, versus it just kind of cycling um, in the system. Yeah. That's, that number is based on basically looking at the percentage organic matter and then doing like a straight calculation. And that really very rarely holds up for any. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of labs do that. This is from soil test, but a lot of labs use this estimated nitrogen release. And I mean, if you look at standard, like at organic matter, organic matter does have a certain percentage of nitrogen in it, which is fairly consistent across organic matter. But the release of that nitrogen to an available form is not consistent. You know, it's going to depend on moisture. Tillage, we know, is a big thing because a lot of organic matter can be protected and not available so but if you till you do get this big burst of, of nitrogen so those those numbers are not that useful so that was just a kind of a comment to just a little bit of word of caution because honestly i stumbled into that of like oh i don't need to add any nitrogen and then being like well actually it really helps um so something to just be aware of another thing i want to point out is these sites were super low in phosphorus um, and I know this site in particular is pretty good in phosphorus wise, um, but that I think had a real impact on establishment of our, our no-till seedings. Um, there, yeah. So it's definitely, you know, site and context really matter. Um, this little orange table is pulled out from this nutrient management for pastures in Western Oregon and Western Washington. If you haven't seen it, um, I think personally I think it's a great reference for you have a soil test trying to figure out what would be a recommended nitrogen or, or fertilizer amendment rate. Um, has for if you're establishing a new pasture or new hay field or if you're um, amending an existing one. So just a little plug for that and I think you'll send that around. So we based our fertilizer rates off of that guide. Um, and then on the fourth page, just again, this is pretty early results. We haven't had a chance to do a deep dive into it, but looked at the, this is the wet weight. So it hasn't been dried down yet, but response um, at those three different sites to our different fertilizer treatments. Um, Dill Road, you can see Pretty good response in both years to those increased rates. Uh, Beaverton and Caulfield, we saw a pretty su substantial increase in uh, 2020, um, not so much in 2021. Can't say for sure, but I think part of that might have been due to the um, drier conditions in 2021. Um, just again, being more moisture limited than nutrient limited. Um, we'll say, you know, and also both those sites are much more productive than the Dill Road site. If you look at the, the highest fertilizer rate on Dill Road in 2021, starts to get close to those other two sites. So again, it was a really, really degraded hay field, um, but through that amendment was able to increase some productivity. So we have more work to do there in terms of kind of looking at the uh, quality still, but we did see a pretty good quality boost in terms of, again, protein content um, in that first year, and we haven't done our second year yet on that. Uh, and then on... So a couple different ways, yeah. And you'll notice I'm 
kind of just ended up talking about fertilizer and not any no-till seeding we did. So in these trials, we had very, very limited establishment of what we direct seeded. Um, so again, we direct seeded an Italian ryegrass and a, and a white clover. We had plots that were seeded and plots that were unseeded. So we were able to pull that apart a little bit that way. Because I was curious if there's an interaction between those fertilizer amendment and seeding. Um, when we did our sampling for biomass and, and quality, we also did a species composition. So we looked at everything that was there. Um, there were a few sites and a few plots where I could actually pull out. We got some ryegrass and we got some white clover, but a very, very small percentage of the overall um, composition at, at, at those sites. So haven't totally dug down into all the numbers yet, uh, and, and we will be working on that. But I think the in those trials, the no-till seeding was not a success. Um, Does this happen on our part? <laughs> Yeah. WSU. Maybe it's just WSU. Of success in no -till There's some out here. Okay. We're saving that for the last. Yeah. yeah. You should be planting right now instead of listening to us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was trying to refresh my, it looks like we planted this September 29th. So this might have been even a little bit late. But then we did a spring planting too, which we did not do at your farm. And I don't know if that had an effect, but Brooke will tell us. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know, yeah, I think there was maybe some elk pressure at your farm. <laughs> Yeah, that was interesting. So, at Bright Eyes, we did a similar trial to this, but we had some grasses in there as well, and um, and we had a tillage component. So we did a full till, and then we did kind of with a flail mower where we really tried to dig it into the soil. That's not, that didn't work. Um, we have a better tool now that I think would work better. We have a power harrow, which would, we did not have at the time. So um, I would try that if we were to do it again. And then we did just the, well, we tried to graze it. We did that. <laughs> we had some, <laughs> we, had some, we were chased sheep all over Misha's farm. Because we were trying to overgraze it, and their idea of overgrazed was different than ours. They were like, this, they were like, this is done, we're out of here. Yeah. Um, so that was one idea we had, was just to graze it really low and then, to drill, and then take the no-till drill. Anyway, I remember going back there uh, a month or so later, and we had, you know, we had germination, and we had, you could row out some things, especially in the full-till plots. But then by spring, it was just like everything was gone. And um, I don't know if it was elk pressure or... Um, or a hard freeze or something, but well, this uh, Martin just, Cheney at the NRCS keeps telling me and reminding me that some of those, especially like fescue, are so slow to establish that you may not even really see the right. first year. You might be the second. Right. So yeah. maybe you need to do a longer term study maybe for a couple of years. Like they might hang out until they just like don't really notice them. Yeah.
I will say on the on the white clover that we planted, so that was fall of 2019, and then t spring of 2020 didn't really see much. Spring of 2021 felt like I was starting to see a little bit more. So I think that's one that's maybe a little bit slow to establish where it's, you know, maybe it's seeded, um, maybe you're not going to see it. It's a tiny little plant, but maybe it'll it'll hang out and and slowly fill in over time. I think. I think it's a super good question in terms of what is working well in terms of this notion of no-till planting directly into pasture. I think I've heard some really great anecdotal success and then like I've had my own just complete utter failures and so trying to puzzle those things together I think is is still a little bit of work in progress. I think for for this particular trial um, a couple of hunches was one maybe it was a little bit too late maybe we should have been planting you know, now or even some people even recommend planting early September or even August and then the seed is in the ground as soon as it starts raining it'll it'll pop it'll just hang out and while it's dry and then it'll go so planting timing and the other thing I think that is a I've again this is just kind of like observationally is trying to get the soil nutrition a little bit sorted out at, before you plant so these sites were again super low in phosphorus and so for the legumes to establish i think not helping them mm -hmm. at all if it's not detrimental to plant early and just the seed hang out could you conceivably go in right after the hay yeah and not have this actually nice stand? but talk to uh ward bryant and he has his own no-till drill and has done a lot out on the peninsula and that's what he does he seeds right after he hays what it does is Yeah. I'm concerned about like inconsistent precipitation at that point, though. You know, right? That's a little bit of a, like right. Yeah. What if we get more. that one rain in August that we sometimes get, and then we get a sprout in there? Just mm -hmm. could that work in kiwi country? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But were you yeah. saying? I think it was you that I was talking to that one farmer had did, did seeds in August and had a lot more success. So that seems like an interesting thing to try. Yeah, like uh, letting it hang. I think, I don't know, if you're anything like me, you're always kind of behind, and so that's why you end up <laughs> planting in early October. <laughs> After all the, you know, you read all the literature that says never plant later than, or November 15th, and you're like, or, or September 15th. You're like, okay. but, so I, I think, it, you know, yeah, timing, maybe we'll, maybe we'll learn eventually that we really do have to plant earlier. But, um, yeah, I was just thinking if there's anything else on that no-till. The other, I guess the other thing from that trial that we did see, and that's on page five, is we have started to see, particularly in that really degraded site, an increase in the, from the fertilizer, there's, there seems to be an increase in the percent grass cover starting to fill in. So just from species there, um, there's a little bit of orchard grass, and that's what that chart is on, on page five is that was starting to fill in a little bit more. Um, so I think that is hopeful to me that some of that kind of just working on some of that amendment can help shift that species composition in a, a good way. We're not going to get rid of the daisies just doing that. Um, that, was, that was wishful thinking, but um, it did help get some more desirable species um, a little bit more abundant in that trial and that photograph is what that field looks like in august so it's it's literally clumps of daisies with dirt in between um yeah i think i hit on most of those kind of preliminary findings in terms of that so enough about fertilizer let's talk a little bit more about the trial here anybody have any other kind of questions about those before i shift and Focus more on what we actually have going on here. Yeah. Um, probably. 
but maybe I, I don't necessarily that I noticed. Um, I did, I think on the really high rates, um, there was some lodging in, in some of those fields where those grass was, you know, lush and falling over. So maybe was overdoing it at some level. Um, I think the big thing for me is kind of, you know, thinking about your own operation and how you're, how those amendments work into that and what are different sources you can use that are economical for, for forage or hay production. So I think that would be my big kind of caution. And, um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Usually there's some just really horrible, dumb thing that I've done, but I don't I think we did okay on that one. Yeah. Huh. We didn't go that far. Yeah. And it was, you know, again, we're using organic fertilizer. So I'm, you know, curious and kind of in terms of, you know, it's a slower release, lower percent available N. So I'm thinking is it may have some kind of lasting effect, but it's, we haven't done the side by side on that one either. And because those, that's kind of an interesting question. If you have the same like pounds of nitrogen, but they're really different forms, are you going to see a, a different long term effect? You used feather meal? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, feather meal pretty much acts like a commercial fertilizer. I think within the season, at least 75% of it's available, available. research okay. shows. So. Yeah. I mean, it's a little slower, but yeah. like over the course of a season, you've almost reached full mineralization. Okay. Um, yeah. Whereas if you use something else with lower, like an alfalfa meal would be at the other extreme, might have two percent nitrogen as opposed to the 11 percent that's going to be you know, over the course of one season you may only get 25 percent of that actual in available yeah. so yeah but yeah we see feather meal working almost like a commercial firm. yeah <laughs> it's, it's pretty, pretty fast yeah. yeah it's kind of addictive <laughs> <laughs> feather meal <laughs> like i want to see something in response yeah um Okay, well, uh, we can shift here and, yeah, do a little bit more talking in the shade, and then we can go look around a little bit um, and, and see a little bit what we've seen. So we did this same trial here and then also in San Juan County. I'm just going to mostly talk about the one here because, honestly, it's actually been a bit more of a, a, a success. Um, so this was started in fall of 2020, um, and... Doug, help me out here if I've, I've screwed any of this up, but no, it was flail mode um, late September there and planted with this no-till drill. Um, and then in the spring, so that, I should back up a little bit. The basic idea of this trial, was, as we mentioned, was to look at different legume species, see which, if any, will establish well into an existing hay field um, with only real pre-planting management being flail mowing really hard um, and then we also wanted to compare a, a fall planting and a spring planting to see if there was any difference in terms of establishment with those um, yeah we found out this morning we were talking to, Pete, to the farmer here Peter Allison and um, I think he said around 2001 so yeah a long time ago He had cows up until three or four years ago. And so, and then since then, I think he's just been haying it. Just trying to get an idea of what you started with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is a soil test in here, super tiny printout, so I apologize for that. But you can get a little bit of sense of kind of what those basic levels are. Um, yeah, in terms of, yeah, so again, we we did spring planting in April. Um, we did also a, a fertilizer application just to help out a little bit with um, a little bit of N and a little bit of uh, potassium. In the trial in San Juan County, we added more phosphorus because again, it was really low phosphorus site. And then we measured biomass and, and species composition and will measure quality. So we did a sampling in, in late June um, and then he hayed around the plots after that. Um, this down here is the list of species that we planted. So we have hairy vetch, alfalfa, red clover, white clover, bird's foot trefoil. Uh, and there are 
different variety names there. Something that is just interesting is there is, of course, there's variation within those species in terms of which cultivar or variety you pick. So something to keep an eye on and think about. Um, and then just our different seeding rates that we went for. Some of the seed, particularly the birdsfoot trefoil, was super low germination, so we planted a lot more seed to kind of try and get to account for that low, low germination rate. It's a pretty hard one to establish, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> That's what the... <laughs> it's sold yeah. without germination? Ah, uh, they gave me a deal. <laughs> That's like under laboratory conditions. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's what they measured, and then we way upped the... So yeah, your target seeding rate for bird's foot trefoil, if it had 100% germ or 95% germ, would be 8 pounds per acre, and we planted 32 pounds per acre here. You're going to be hard-pressed to find any bird's foot trefoil out there, so... In that's tilled. Uh, is what it is, but a little bit showed up in the tilled plots. Um, So the germination percentage is there. We did not do a oh, stand Oh, like count. did what actually came up. So yeah, that would be called a stand count, and we didn't do that. No. But we did do... Would be a great thing to do, and I really wish I'd done it at your farm, because I swear I saw plants, <laughs> but I didn't, like, count them. <laughs> um, yeah. And so then target, we did do a till okay. demonstration here. So we didn't, it's not, a, this, it's not included in the replicated trial, but I just wanted to see, you know, what would we get if we tilled. So that's over there. And we did that in the spring and the fall. And so it was not ideal tillage establishment. We literally brought everything here on one day, spaded it, mowed it, drilled, and then seeded and then went home. So... <laughs> We can talk about what might be a better way to, if you were going to do the tillage, but you can see we did get some different establishment, I guess, with the tillage. Yeah. Got pretty good. Um, yeah, any other questions about the varieties or germinations there, seeding rates? I think seeding rates a little bit of an unknown, too, for some of this direct seeding into an established pasture or, um, you know, doesn't need to be higher. I kind of assume so, but I don't know. Um, yeah, and then the next page there is just a soil test again. Um, you can look at that in more detail if you want. I think something that was interesting to me is, yeah, the just generally better nutrient levels than the sites I've been working with. So I think that may have helped a little bit with the establishment here. Um, this third page is just our trial map. So you have kind of a sense of the layout of the different seeding treatments and um, planting times. And those are what all the little flags are marking those plots out there. And we'll go take a look at those plots in a minute. Um, and then this species list. So in, in June 22nd of this summer, we came out and looked at all those plots and did kind of a species composition within the little quadrat um, in, the, in each of those plots. Um, couple subsamples in each one and kind of estimated and it's it's crude I will admit but the kind of percent cover of those different species in that in that area so what this list gives you is kind of a sense of kind of what are the dominant species here so tall fescue there's a lot of horsetail quite a bit of fort um, orchard grass a little bit of red top um, quite a bit of this uh, weed called yellow rattle a um, few other grass species the highest percent legume that was there was um, the small hop clover I don't know if folks are familiar with that it's kind of a I think it's an annual got a, kind of a little yellow flower on it um, so yeah generally that you know not a lot of legumes in that this mind you this includes also what we planted um this is average across all the plots average across all the plots um so the hairy vetch and i'll talk more of that that only showed up in the plants where plots where we had planted it that wasn't just here 
Um, some of the red clover was just here. Some white clover was just here. But those are, those are what we found. Um, if you flip to the next page, on page five, um, the two graphs at the top there are the hairy vetch, and the one on the left is planted in the fall, and the one on the right is planted in the spring. So that graph is, shows kind of the percent cover or amount of hairy vetch, and then the bars down there are the different seeding treatments. So we didn't find any in the alfalfa plot or the control plot. Um, on average, we had about 4% cover in the plot where we planted hairy vetch, um, and it didn't show up in any of the other sites. So we did have successful establishment in, of, with our fall planting. Um, same in the, in the spring planted, but actually did a lot better planted in the spring. Um, and we had up to you know about 20% of those plots uh, we had hairy vetch kind of coverage. So it's not a strict biomass measurement, but kind of a um, canopy cover estimate. Uh, somewhat, the other sort of success story here was the red clover. Uh, and that one, there's some just in the field. You can see it just popping up here and there. But in terms of, if you look at the plot that's labeled red clover, um, we had on average about 10% cover from the fall planted there. So that one did well. Um, the spring planted plots was a little bit more all, all over and I don't think it was as obviously successful at least in at that point that we're looking at it. And then you can see that it's just kind of showing up in a bunch of the different plots. So less of a pattern there. So those were the two species that we had the best establishment here um, in San Juan County. It was a, a total bust except for the spring planted um, hairy vetch established. So again, lots of challenges and questions, but I think it was hopeful to me to start to see that there was some, some potential there that, and particularly with the red clover planted in the fall and that and hairy vetch in terms of, of one that was established. Um, any, yeah, white clover, I think, was a little hard to tell. There's some just in the field, so we didn't really see an obvious uh, effect from treatment. Again, it's a, maybe a little bit slower growing, so it may take time to, to get established um, later. So we'll keep, we're going to look at plots today. So far, we haven't seen a whole lot, and then hopefully next spring. So we'll hopefully be able to fo follow it long enough to, to Doug, just do a double take. One more. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll have, we have samples um, of, yeah, all the plots. So it's not just a before and after, but a comparison to the control where we didn't plant anything. So we'll see if there's any measurable, and I don't know yet if there's a measurable increase in biomass from the hairy vet, vetch um, or a change in quality. Um, so and then analyze for, nit sorry, analyze for nitrogen or do you do, do directly for protein? Uh, be cr yeah, crude protein. So do a forage quality test on that dried sample. And that gives some indication of, you know, a bunch of other forage quality parameters, but I tend to clue in on protein just because it's simple, I guess. And is that a different, you get different results if you just look at total nitrogen? I don't know. It probably is, I don't know. Yeah. So one more sampling next spring around. Yeah. Around yeah. the same time, or that was like June we did it this year. Probably right? around the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then we have this quality analysis. Hopefully we can get that done this fall. Yeah, and then other than that, we haven't seen establishment of the alfalfa or the bird's foot trefoil in, in the no-till seeded plots. That's kind of the spiel. I would love to go take a look at Doug's, the tilled plots and then you can see a little bit of the remnants and of what was a successful seeding in the just untilled area.
uh, just to recap again, we the main focus was this trial back there, but um, I was interested in tilling and planting just because you know some of these crops we also use as cover crops, and I just thought it might be helpful to see how they do without the competition uh, of an established pasture. And I would be interested to hear what people do if you are going to till and establish a pasture, because I don't, you know, I don't think this is necessarily the best way to do it, just to do it all in one day. We do have a spader, so a spader does a really good job of kind of turning over the soil and making a nice, um, you know, seed bed, all things considered. But I guess in my mind, it would be better to till it a couple of times, let some weeds come up, you know, do some kind of a stale seed bed, and then and then plant if you were going to do that. But I'm not a pasture establishment specialist at a, or anything. Um, but we did have some success. Uh, so this was the fall planted. The, there's about six of these plots. The, the last one that's not labeled, we didn't, that was the no cover crop or no uh, pasture crop. And then right where Brook is, that was spring tilled and planted going that direction. So from... Um, the fall planted, when we were here, when we came in the spring, there was definitely more hairy vetch than there is. So I don't know what it's kind of, you know, I think it, it may kind of die off in the uh, um, hot heat of the summer, but then it's still there. Uh, and maybe it's reseeding itself. I know the other thing too, when we came in the spring to do the spring planting, there was hairy vetch where we did not plant it. So I would say there is some out there, but it's going to kind of show up in the spring and then um, and then die. So it's uh, there's not much hairy vetch left in the fall planted, but if you go to the spring planted, you can see uh, more hairy vetch. And then as the data shows, the red clover uh, is doing pretty well. You can see we did see one bird's foot trefoil plant somewhere <laughs> from the fall planted because there is some think, in the spring oh, planted, maybe it was right? in the spring planted yeah the spring planted there we got bird's foot and we got alfalfa too so this is the spring planted there's a little more to see the alfalfa the red clover looks good in both um a yeah. little bit of white clover but not very much and then this I don't know, Renee, maybe you can tell us, is this your, or Brooke, is that the bird's foot? No. Doesn't? No. Nope. Not convinced. Really? Yeah, it's got kind of pointy, kind of egg-shaped leaves, or a little kind of pointier A little bit of hairy vetch here. That might be one. Yeah. Yeah, no irrigation. Yep. The one. The survivor. It's the only one that germinated. Oh, there you go. Do any of you have experience doing kind of tillage based reseeding? And what is, yeah, what have you, have you, have you done in that? We've tried all kinds of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of canary grass and plants that come in. Yeah. I think what we've found best is we'll till it up and smooth out the field and get it ready to plant. And then we wait and we'll let it sprout. Yeah. Whenever it's going to sprout, we'll round it up. Mm hmm. Yeah. We just roll it in. Mm. Timothy. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It, that, that seems to get rid of the weeds the best of grasses we don't want. Yeah. Because in, in the past, what we would do is we'll finish off the field, we spray it, we ground it up. And then when we do decide to seed it, you go out, you seed it, and just lightly disc it in. You're bringing up all kinds yeah. of fresh new seeds and roots that mm -hmm. were already in there. They yeah. They all sprout. Yeah. Are you yeah. planting in the fall or in the spring when you're doing that, or both? both. Yeah. That 
that seems to be the most successful way. Well, tilling. We haven't tried the no-till. That's why I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to get to instinct. Not me on top of it. It's going to do anything or not. Maybe no. we're too late in strong measure. Are you going to do broadcast like you normally? We do broadcast with Tim Dave. If you don't see the broadcast results, it's going to drop in February or April. Then I'm in the spring when I'm running the mill. We have to run. We can basically air what it into the ground. Hopefully I'll load it really hard like you guys are talking about. I'm trying to get some coverage over it. Mm. If it takes good, we can get six, seven, eight yeah. years. Hmm. And what we do is we just we cut it for hay, and we don't know the results till we cut. We look at the hay and we say, okay, this is good timothy, we'll sell that as good timothy. Then it'll be a mix, we sell that for a little bit less money. And then eventually it becomes just a feeder hay for cows, and that means it's time to till that field. So, huh. so we do let them degrade. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Still, yeah, maybe for some species, maybe not so well for others, but worth trying. Is there one you used on here? Is that a specific West Side variety? I don't remember. The names of them. Alpha, alpha. Um, no, I got it from the Ioka seeds. So I yeah talked a little bit about what they're doing. But a couple of years ago, there was a trial at Mount Vernon where they did looked at a couple of different alfalfa varieties and planted them um just drew corbin did that oh, okay um and it yeah so that's that's kind of the only variety trial of alfalfa i've seen that's there's just a little bit of limited information but there are some beautiful stands in skagit valley of alfalfa um, i know some folks on whidbey island who grow alfalfa hay so it it is yeah there's yeah, yeah there's a guy down yeah. So it, it can grow <laughs> on the west side. <laughs> there it is. Um, I think it needs a nurse crop. I think I'm, I chatted with Steve really Branson a couple pressure. years ago. Yeah, you want to plant it with a rye grass, but I can't remember if you want the rye to start up first and then the alfalfa or vice versa. I can't remember. It's worth checking the soil type just to see if it's well adapted for alfalfa because there just aren't a lot of soils around Well, second, yeah, I'd 
my wife's farm operation planted a bunch of alfalfa as kind of as a cover and it was a total bust and I think it was a combination of wet it was planted in the fall it was, it was really wet fall winter scene and then also low nutrient availability and it, you know it's a few plants here and there but some of the other stuff like outside clover that we planted did much better in that sort of a little bit tougher situation so yeah it does seem like it can be a little fussy should we go look at the no-till plots see if we can see anything Um, so I will say it is, you know, it's, you, none of you are probably going to be knocked over within like, wow, this is really, really obvious. I was frankly very excited in the spring when we came down here and, and saw some of the successful establishment. So this, so that's labeled spring hairy vetch. Um, so it's pretty well dried up now, but you can see, and there is a little bit, and you're welcome to wander around out here if you want, get a closer look. But so here is one of those hairy vetch plants survived, and then um, here's one that's just all dried up. So it's an annual, so it's just gonna burn up and go. Um, so there was some establishment of that successfully. Um, and then, yeah, you can see a little bit more down through here. So the way this is laid out is the plots are going like this, and then every one of those flags is another plot and then it's replicated on down the field um, four times so you can see a little bit of that and that was like I said the most sort of visually dramatic um, and we can see find the red clover plot and see if we can find any there 